excited about tonight's topic, of course. We are looking at generations in the workplace. No, Cleveland doesn't have a Golden Gate Bridge yet. See, that that's wishful thinking, <laughs> Michael. Oh, Michael is coming in hot with the comedy today. I appreciate that. Okay, I'm making you the host again. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, you're all set. You're going on YouTube and you're recording, so... All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. At We are going to give it one more minute and then we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to just start sharing my screen right now, um, just so that you know that you are in the right place. All right. If you are here for our SCORE um, Soft Skills Workshop, um, tonight's topic who's in the workplace. Um, we are going to be looking at generations in the workplace tonight. And um, we are, looks like it's about that time, about time to go. So we will not delay this fun fest any longer. We're going to go right ahead and jump on in. Um, before we get started talking directly about our topic, we're going to talk a little bit about SCORE. Anita, did you want to talk about SCORE? Or did you want me to go ahead and do No, that? you can go ahead. That's fine. All right. Fantastic. So what you see here is the is SCORE's mission and value statement here. SCORE's mission, obviously, is to foster vibrant small business communities through mentoring and education. Um, we aim to give every person the support they need to thrive as a small business owner. Small business drives our national economy through business formation, job creation, and wealth building. Small businesses are critical to vibrant communities and in our society. And, you know, again, a little fun fact I'd like to share is that really small business owners make up 80% of our, our, um, our world's, well, not world's, but our United States um, uh, labor um, uh, employers, rather. So 80% is nothing to sneeze at. So our small businesses are needed, valued, and we definitely are here to support. All right. So moving right along, SCORE has the largest network of free volunteer small business mentors in the nation. So no matter what stage of your business um, you're in, SCORE has a mentor for you. And it's easy to request a mentor to help you get started, to grow or transition your business today. And so as I've been explaining in some of the other sessions, you know, we are it's not just about folks that are already in business. You know, there are there are volunteer mentors for those that um, can help you if you're just thinking about starting a business. You have this idea and and you're not sure where to start and you want to, you know, kind of put some things in motion. There are mentors for that. If you are an ex established business and you're looking at scaling or you're looking at expanding in some way, um, mentors to help you do that. And also, if you're at that point in your business where you're feeling like I'm ready to exit the business and I'm not sure what the best way is to go about that, I don't want to just shut down abruptly. I want to be able to phase my way out. There are mentors for that as well. So um, there's a little something for everyone. Um, also, we serve a diverse group of entrepreneurs. And here are just a few. You know, you have Black entrepreneurs, veterans, women, Hispanic, um, and again, that's just to name a, a few, but we are here for everyone. SCORE empowers all entrepreneurs to succeed. So we're going to talk a little bit more about SCORE, and I'll give you some more information um, as we kind of close out this uh, session, but today and right now, we're looking at who's in the, in the workplace, understanding the differences between generations in the workplace. 
And so tonight's facilitators are myself, Karen Cross Hatton, and my fabulous uh, and infamous infamous co-pilot, Tracy White, uh, Watts Serino. I'm sorry, I'm just tongue-tied here tonight. Um, and we are here and delivering this um, webinar for you and so, so, so excited to be here. Um, here's a little bit of a look at what tonight is going to look like. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna give a disclaimer right up front uh, because when we talk about generations in the workplace, there are some folks that are very, very sensitive to the kind of blanket statements about particular generations. And so the disclaimer here is that certainly this isn't an end all be all. Um, this is just as the world kind of defines generations. And, you know, if you were are a millennial and you were raised by a grandparent, certainly your thoughts and actions may be different, um, but this is just general information. So that's kind of the general disclaimer that I'm gonna give. We are going to um, look at some definition um, about what a generation is, discuss the generations that are in the workplace now, we're gonna talk about managing generations in the workplace, and then we're gonna talk a bit um, about closing the gap. But before we do that, I want to go back and I want to talk a little bit and just kind of tell you all about myself. Um, I am a SCORE um, volunteer, although I don't currently do a lot of mentoring independently. I have co-mentored a bit, um, but I am a volunteer on the workshop and events committee. And so these are kind of this is kind of where I, I live in the space of trying to deliver content that um, I feel um, is valuable, that you all have said is valuable to you. Um, and I am also an entrepreneur myself. Um, and so, and I am a SCORE mentee. So uh, just, I try to get um, involved as much as possible, but certainly um, love to share. And then I'm going to turn the mic over to my co-pilot, Tracy, and she can introduce herself to you all as well. And then we're going to dive into our content. Hello. I was just putting in the chat that Karen is an amazing presenter. She um, is always so very humble. So it is an honor and privilege to have the opportunity to do this with her. Um, I, I love the way that Karen puts content together. and always shares it in a really fun, exciting way that makes it really relatable. And that is what I have completely fostered my entire career on is sharing my hurdles of when I fall down and stumble, oh, what's the solution? And that that that's literally how I have become a five-time number one international bestselling author and a podcast host of Beyond Common Business Secrets, which is currently ranked as one of the top 5% of podcasts in history of podcasts. Um, I always think it's because I talk too much, but it really is because I share in a really vulnerable way what's really going on. Um, and as Karen said, my name is Tracy Watts Serino. And really, I put in the chat that this topic tonight about generations in the, in the workforce, it really can be trigger- it's a trigger alert. Just know that this is an open, safe space and we're all here to help. And it's okay, even if you do get triggered, we're gonna work through that. So we're here to support you. And this is the place to kind of challenge and talk about the little uncomfortable topics that come up with different generations being part of the workforce right now. So just know that we're here to serve you. Um, Fantastic. Thank you so you much, Tracy. Yeah, I was just trying to get to my mute button. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. Hold on. Let me get us moving here. All right. So first of all, you know, what is a generation, right? So according to the Oxford Dictionary, a de generation is all of the people born or living about the same time, right? That's simple and kind of cut and dry. Right. And so that's kind of a general broad overview of how we're defining generations. When we're looking at generations in the workplace right now, 
what we can see is as of 2023, there are actually five generations in the workplace. You have your traditionalists, your baby boomers, your Generation X or Gen Xers, millennials, and your Gen Z or um, Generation Z, right? So these are the categories that cover everyone between the ages of 16 and 75, which the Bureau of Labor, uh, Labor Statistics kind of breaks it down even further into categories by decade. <laughs> and so, you know, they, I mean, it can, you can really get into the weeds with this, but for the purpose of tonight's conversation, we, we're, we're not going to take it that far, right? But there are, so there are five generations right now in the workplace. And so um, right now here, oh, excuse me, let me move us ahead. All right. So the five generations again, we have, and then there's a larger research, but the five generations again that are in the workplace where this is just kind of re a repeat, but I just wanted you to know that there is also a, a research report out there that um, can, it kind of addresses some of the cutoff years and the attributes um, of the various sources. Um, because from source to source, depending on where you where you look, it's also defined differently. The years and the attributes that, you know, of each generation. So there's more there. But let's kind of jump in here and look. So our traditionalists, also known as the silent generation, if you've ever ha heard that, this group was born between 1928 and 1945 during the Great Depression and war, World War II. So although the youngest members are in their late 70s, they're steadily growing in the workforce um, because fewer of them are retiring. And some of those that have retired are finding themselves coming back to work um, as greeters in different places, um, just to be able to supplement their, their incomes. So according to, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, again, around 12% of the people above 75 will actively participate in the workforce by 2030. So that's a huge jump again from just 5% in 2020. And so I'm going to just kind of throw it out there and I want to know what your thoughts are in the chat. Why do you think that there is such an increase? 12 from from 5% in 20 in in 2000 in 2000 rather um to a 12% by 2030. What what are some of the reasons you think that some of our traditionalists are returning to work? Boomers are best. All right, Michael. <laughs> and if you don't want to type in the chat, you can feel free to unmute yourself and let's participate in the conversation. Absolutely, Elizabeth. People are living longer and are more active. Yep. That is spot on. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Right, so people are living longer, they're more active. Um, as we look at various things where, you know, some the cost of living has increased so much. And, you know, oftentimes folks are just trying to get a little bit extra because they're not able to continue to live off of what social security or sometimes their pensions may be providing them. Some folks just, retire and they're bored. They yeah, want that's to what feel I was useful. To touch on, Karen. Oh yeah. The number one, th when I talk to anyone of this generation, mm -hmm. they say, oh, I've tried retirement several mm -hmm. times. And I think there's a fear from what I've, what I've heard and what, you know, what people have shared with me is that there's a fear that they know too many friends that have died mm -hmm. that got bored. So yep. they're really like afraid of being bored and end up go, you know, but it's been cool of how many different careers they have had the opportunity to have. 
Absolutely. So um, I love talking to people of this generation. It, their, their wisdom is amazing. Absolutely. And they want to feel useful, yeah. right? They know that they've given so much over time and they want to feel useful. They still feel like, and they know that they still have something of value to offer in the workplace. So let's talk about our boomers, which Michael is obviously a boomer because he says boomers are the best, right? So our boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. Many baby boomers retired during the pandemic and continued to free up jobs for younger generations. On average, boomers held 12 jobs over their lifetime. That's an average only half of which were after the age of 24. Their loyalty to their positions gives them a deep understanding of their job role and chosen industry. You know, and again, you know, why do you think that there was such kind of a, of a boost in retirement of our boomers after the pandemic? Let's drop a few thoughts in the chat. And or you can feel free to unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Silence doesn't bother me. I'll wait for you. <laughs> Karen, what was the question? Oh, the question is, why do you think that so, that many of the baby boomers retired during the pandemic? Um I have a lot of I have a lot of answers to this question. Okay. But the number one reason I hear from people why mm -hmm. they retired during the pandemic was because of how hard it was to hire people. Yeah. That is the number one reason that um, boomers either, if they had anything to do with hiring in their corporate job or decided to walk away from their business and sell it on to the next generation, mm -hmm. everyone I have <laughs> asked this question of, mm -hmm. it always relates back to the hiring challenges. Like it mm. just was too hard. So that... I don't know if that is statistically correct, but in my world, who I talk to, that is that is the 99% of the time the answer that I receive. Right. And and you know, and I've talked to a lot of folks that retired. I was in an institution that around the pandemic um laid folks off and then you had a huge influx of folks that were um, also retiring and had been there for a long time. Um, and then since the pandemic, some of those retired folks have come back to try to do some things on a part-time basis. Um, and actually responses varied. Some of them just didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with the whole idea of the pandemic, right? Um, when folks were being called back to work, they're just like, I don't feel safe and I don't want to return. You know, I feel like if we've been off this long, we can figure out how to be off, you know, a little bit longer. Um, there were a lot of folks and and this is just across generations, not just boomers. There were a lot of folks that kind of went into the pandemic and into into working from home, kind of kicking and screaming um, because they they liked being able to get up and leave the house and go outside and, you know, where they could get whatever support they needed, whether that was with technology or anything else. And then once we were out for so long, people seemed to find their new normal in that and they didn't want to return. They The thought of coming back and doing the nine to five and actually having to dress differently, because if you notice, even folks you know, of all generations dress a little differently coming to work today than they did pre-pandemic. You know what I mean? People were comfortable. They were finding ways to be able to manage their life, their family things, and other obligations along with that. And they just didn't want to go back to doing kind of that nine to five. They wanted, they, they embraced the flexibility that they were starting to, um, 
that they were starting to enjoy during that time after we got all over the panic and upset of it, right? So anybody else? Nope. All right. Well, let's keep this train moving. Gen Xers. So our Generation X was born between 1965 and 1980. They were latchkey kids um, during childhood, and they are known for their independence. They grew up in a time when more women swapped domestic roles for the job market. So many were home alone after school um, before both parents returned from work. And I will say that's my generation. I am a Gen Xer and I find that to be true. I was a latchkey kid. I was the oldest of four at the time. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that does resonate. My mom was at home at one point and then all of a sudden she wasn't. So um, I find that particular piece to be relevant to me. And then we have our millennials or Gen Yers, right? They're born between 1981 and 1996. Millennial, millennials sort of sit on both sides of the technological shift, right? So they were born before the popularization of the internet and personal computers, um, the Great Recession, um, was a tough job market and high school student loans defined many millennials entrance um, to the workforce. So, um, you know, I personally, as a Gen Xer, I was in high school and I learned to type on a typewriter. So, you know, I had to kind of grow with technology. You know, I have children, I have two millennials and <laughs> one Gen Zer, so I'm, um, you know, we're kind of all over the place. But it was kind of nice to have all those generations in the household because they were able to teach me things and keep me up to speed with things that you know I wasn't as familiar with. Does anybody else? Can anybody else kind of share a story or or how does that resonate with anyone? I'm on the cusp of this, so okay. I'm like I depending on where you read it. Mm -hmm. I fall either at the very end of Gen X or the very beginning of millennial. Gotcha. But I always have worked as hard as a boomer. So it never right, really made right. sense. Right. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, where Just depending on which one you read, like where I fall in. Because I, right. I, I don't think I fully embrace any of them. I think I have a little piece from each of the generations. Right. And, just like how I show up in the workforce. Yeah. And again, that's how that is what I said in, in, in our disclaimer, right? Mm -hmm. These are just frameworks. These are just guidelines, but certainly through our experience, our upbringing, kind of the core values in our households and the things that we were taught and who was doing the teaching certainly impacts a little bit of all of that, right? And um, kind of how we show up um, in the workplace. So thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Anybody else have a share? Okay. Generation Z, that is the newest working generation. This group was born between 1997 and 2012. The Gen Zers are digital natives. Coming of age with cell phones, social media, and rapidly developing new technology. They represent over one fourth of the American population and are the most diverse generation in U.S. history. So again, these are the folks that are in the workplace and you can tell just from kind of some of our descriptions and some of our own experiences with other folks in other generations in the workplace, you know, that that makes up, um, a very diverse group of folks and can present challenges, but also opportunities in the workplace, you know, if we all walk into it with the right mi mindset, right? So when we're talking about managing or before we go on to managing folks in the workplace, I just want to make sure that we don't have any questions or everybody is kind of picking up what I'm putting down thus far. Um, or any comments before we kind of move on? 
give me a thumbs up. I was just going to say that I'm surprised that last generation isn't called the YouTube (laughs) generation, YouTube career generation. Right. That's like what my 10 year old, he falls in that, you know, Uh just on the cusp of it. He's Mm -hmm. like, well, uh, I'm not going to have a regular job. I'm just going to have my YouTube channel. So it's just a really funny thing of where you're right. we'll see what's to come. Right. Like, right. <laughs> right. Uh, we will see what's to come. Absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. So here are some things that we need to kind of look at and, and, you know, answer like, why is it even important to have this discussion? Why is it important to deal with any of it at all? Well, understanding the generations is important because it addresses the generational gap, which is the difference in behavior, outlook, expectations between the groups of people who were born at distinctly different times, right? And in during different times when, and and during different times in history, right? Where resources may have been different. um, There could have been a lot of things going on that were different, right? Um, Also, it helps to prevent misunderstandings in especially in managerial roles, right? And it also helps address communication needs. Are we looking at email versus texting and really also understanding who's in the workplace with you, right? If you are a small business owner and you're hiring folks into your organization, kind of understanding some of the nuances of that um, and and the value of being able to have diversity within that workforce. Anything to add, Trace? No, that no. says it all. You said it all. All right, fantastic. So let's, let's look at multi-generational kind of teams here for a moment. Oopsie, let me go back one. All right. So work teams that comprise multiple generations perform better than those that do not. Are there any guesses as to why that that might be? I know this group is quiet, but I'm going to keep on asking the questions. I would say it's because of the diverse thinking. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is that is spot on, Tracy. Diverse thinking. Any other thoughts? I also think that, and we're going to talk about this in next week a lot, mm-hmm. but I also think it's the ability to problem solve is going to be a lot more um, helpful when you're, when you have a team that has some people from each generation. Absolutely. And when you're able to bring experience, right? Life experience, work experience, industry experience together with the technology experience. Um, and like you said, that diverse, that diversity in thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're able to just bring all of these points of view into your organization, you could seriously be on the pathway to prosperity right? Because you're using the best of the best that is out there, right? In both knowledge, experience, and technology. And you have it, 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 if you get it right, if you get the formula right, if you get the mix right, you have one heck of a workforce there, you know, on your side. Um, Also, yeah, go ahead. Michael wants to know if you can cite some examples of bullet number one. Of bullet number one. Um, cite some examples that comprise. Um, well, if you look at even just some of the best places to work, um, when you think about uh, places like Google and Apple and some of those other um, kind of industries, um, you 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 see multiple generations within those companies, and you see like think tanks coming out of some of those companies, right? And those folks that are able to kind of develop um, that that team collaboration, they're able to brainstorm together. Um, those are just a couple of examples that kind of come to mind right away. Um, but certainly there, there are more. Can anybody else think of or work 
in a space that you find that to be to be true. Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, well, you think on it. And if as if you begin to think about some things or some companies, please feel free to add to the conversation. Um, also, an age-diverse workforce gives companies more insight into the marketplace uh, because we are all looking for our information and, and consuming information in different places, right? Um, generationally. Um, and that's, that's not to say that th there's not some crossover, but like um, Tracy, in your example, when you talked about your son saying, hey, we'll find it on YouTube, right? Um, there are folks that still rely on print media, right? And digital me media. There are some folks like my kids, they, they do not do Facebook. That's that's a me thing, right? They don't do Facebook. They're on Instagram. I'm not on Instagram as heavily. Um, you know, they're on TikTok. They're all over the place. And so they're consuming information and we are consuming information. We are all consuming information in different spaces. And so being able to bring that into the workspace to kind of know what's going on definitely is a is a bonus. Um, the multi-generational workforce yields a stronger pipeline of talent, right? And so what do we mean by that? We mean that the more folks you have in there, in your organization that understand the organization, that understand your organizational's, your organization's culture, the leadership, they can refer, right? The more folks you have, they can refer folks, because they have people within their sphere of influence that they think would be good fits in that in in that industry or in that organization and they're not going to just stick their neck out for anybody right so you get an opportunity to have the best of the best and folks that span generations right all right everybody kind of with me picking up what I'm putting down can I get a hands up or thumbs up in the chat or anywhere no <laughs> right um the multi-generational pipeline improves workforce continuity stability and retention of intellectual capital which is so so very important right you want to be able to maintain those things you want to be able to you know have a good pipeline because you don't want to be left if everybody decides to walk away, right? Or if folks, you you get these spurts of retirements and different things that go on, right? You want to be able to have some folks primed and ready so that you don't miss a beat, right? A, a multicultural workforce um, boost, it, it should say boost, <laughs> not booze, but boost the bottom line of many organizations based on greater engagement and performance. Okay. So just a few key things to think about as you're thinking about having, you know, folks and that diversity within your organization. Okay. Any questions, any comments there? All right, let's move. All right, so this is just kind of a diagram of training that I found. I don't necessarily know that it's all correct, but it gives us just a general framework and a foundation to have a conversation about, right? So it's saying in terms of the veterans in the organization, they, you know, have extensive study, they like the classroom, lectures, workshops, books and manuals, that's the veterans and that's the boomers, right? They can deal with PowerPoint, um, course-based learning. Um, as you start to move down in this chart and you look at your Gen Xers and your millennials and kind of some of that overplay, right? You're looking at more kinesthetic learning. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I, I, I need to be hands-on with it. Um, kits, learning is supposed to be fun, Right? Um, exploration um, and learning through play. Um, you know, it's it just kind of 
changes over time. So do you all find this to be true or false or, or what does that look like for you? I think that there's like some com combination of all of this from what I've seen, because I have seen um, sometimes millennials will want a book to write in, but then I'll have a boomer in a, a training that I'm facilitating and they want to have as much fun as possible. So I, I, I love that it, that they try to make this linear and make it that it's just for the certain generations. Right. But I think it's really knowing your audience Absolutely. and really diving a little deeper into what makes your people get the most out of, you know, working with you. Absolutely. And I think it also is about what kind of learner you are. Yeah. Right? So Absolutely. like I said, this, I, I didn't necessarily take 1000% stock in it, but I felt, felt like it was a place to start talking about, you know, what, what you do. I, some folks, I mean, just as by nature are kinesthetic learners. It doesn't just apply to anybody in one particular generation. Some people learn better by doing and putting their hands on things. I personally, I like paper and pencil. I like to be able to write and take notes and fill in the blanks. But I also love the visuals of the PowerPoints. I love fill in the blank things. Um, but I can also do just as well learning using YouTube. You know, anybody uh, else want to share? Go ahead. I want to just address. So Michael was saying that he can't read due to electronics. Okay. So I just want to let him know that that you will be getting the slides at, like you'll get the replay with the slides. So you'll be able to see it then if, if you're saying that it's because of like whatever electronic you're on is too small. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's for another reason, let us know because I'm seeing it clear as day is everybody else seeing, um, the slides. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. And I need my glasses, but so if I can see it, I'm assuming everyone, because I'm kind of blind. Right. But please somebody let us know if you can't. Yeah. So I don't know if Michael's referring to something on his end or if it's something that we can do to improve the visibility. Yeah. Just let us know, Michael. All right. Fantastic. Oh, okay. He was just saying, um, okay. I, uh, Michael said that in general, people have a hard time reading long texts due yeah. to YouTube. They'd rather. Okay. Oh, okay, gotcha. 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 Okay. I oh, thought yeah. he was referring to our, our slide. Oh, okay. Very <laughs> I'm good. like, I can see it. Okay. Michael, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And you're right. And, you know, and especially the more that we have to do, the less we want to delve into a lot of reading. We just want the bullet points these days, right? We just want the highlights. Um, if we can see somebody do it on YouTube, like, you know, we have slowly but surely been embracing technology because technology oftentimes takes the guesswork out of it, right? It, and the more I'm able to see how to do something, the, the more I feel comfortable with it because I can see what it's supposed to look like, right? For me. Um, so, I, yeah, I will. It's so interesting that you're saying that, Karen, because one of the number one things that my clients and students will always give feedback about working with me mm -hmm. is I create these little loom videos mm -hmm. of exactly where to do. Like mm -hmm. if this is how if they want to start a YouTube channel or they want to go on LinkedIn or right. Instagram, I will create a video that walks them through page by page and it's they have the written text or mm -hmm. the video and mm -hmm. it's so makes it so easy and it and it's in alignment with my teaching style right and the way that people learn so um that's definitely a technology if you guys haven't checked it out it's called loom you can make these really amazing training videos and you can use it within your organization to train your team as well oh, so yeah and another nugget that I'm going to write down for tonight too, because we are learning partners in this thing. Absolutely. So, yeah. Cause this what is the website you said it's called loom video L O O M. And 
What does it do? It allows you to. Make- it allows you to make a training video. So just hypothetically, say we were going to um, make these slides for this presentation and someone didn't know how I would have this. I have this training video made. This is how you make the slides and show exactly where to go and where to pull content and, and how you would curate them. So it could be how to create a landing page for your website. I use Loom to teach my clients everything Mm -hmm. so that they have a step-by-step tutorial of how to do it so that when we get off the coaching session, they're not later going, wait, what did she say? Mm -hmm. They'll have a video. So do you have to do a subscription and can you do SOPs on it? Um, Yes. I create all my standard operating procedures and yes, you have to have a, uh, subscription to use it. It's a paid service. Okay. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much. But depending on how much of that work you do, it can be something that kind of pays for itself after a while, right? Exactly. Um, Yeah. It's pretty low cost. And sorry, just to confirm, loom.com, L-O-O-M? L-O-O-M. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And thank you for sharing that, Tracy. All right, any more questions? All right, fantastic. Let's go on and talk a little bit about how to bridge the gap, right? So how do we bridge the gap between the generations? We foster a work environment that respects and values differences. That's like number one key, right? So we wanna be sensitive to various work styles and communicate through different channels because there are some folks that would rather get a text than an email, some that would rather you make a phone call than text or email, some that really like that face-to-face interaction. So they'd rather hop on to a Zoom or have you come to their space to have a conversation. So, you know, it's number one, super important that you know who's in the workplace, who is in your workplace and how do they best like to communicate. And that doesn't necessarily have to do with generations specifically, but it's about people, right? And, And your human capital within your organization. You also want to recruit and uh, you want to have recruitment and retention strategies established across a variety of channels so that you're able to reach a diverse population of of people. You want to go where your potential employees are and where they consume information, right? So just one of those things to keep in mind. You want to offer a range of benefit choices to meet your employees where they are at. You know, so what does that mean? That means that money is not always the only motivator for folks, right? And depending on where they are in their life and kind of their lifestyle, you know, time can mean more to them than than money. You know, um, a varied work schedule, you know, the depending on the benefits that you are offering. So you want to make sure that you have a good offering that really is creates a win-win for everybody, right? The folks in the organization and for you as well, because where, where there are good benefits, people stay, <laughs> people hang around where they can feel like they are valued and their needs are met. You also want to utilize the traditionalists in your training of younger generations. Um, They help to kind of bring that historical knowledge, that industry knowledge. They feel valued as employees because they have a lot to offer and a lot to be able to share. Um, There's also research that shows you that mentoring and pairing um, various generations or folks that are within various generations uh, helps to build that team. And they they're able to give a good exchange, right, of information and good exchange of skills. And they can learn from each other and really become learning partners within your organization. And also involve or older generations in the training of diversity initiatives, right? Because that Karen, helps. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Michael had a question about sure. if you have suggestions how to structure bonus plans to increase retention. 
Well, again, that is number one, knowing who's in your organization. And I'm always going to start, I'm always going to start there. You know, um, what is the culture of your organization? Who's in your organization? What kinds of things do they value? And ways to be able to do that, um, simply talking to people is one way, but if your organization is very large where you're not able to kind of go out and have those personal conversations, survey your, your employees, ask, ask them what things they value. Um, and I'm always going to go with that, that people part of it, right? Because again, especially with as many generations that you have in the workplace, they value something different. And so I would start there. Right. And then I would also, once you get that information, really take that data and read through it, comb through it. If it's something that you are not sure about, go and ask questions about about it. You know, um, if they if you're doing it anonymous, anonymously, you can certainly pose it in a town hall or a staff meeting or whatever. You know, we had some of these suggestions. If any of you um, you know, we weren't quite sure about this. If any of you have some suggestions or can provide some clarity around that, please share. So that would be for me the number one thing to do. Um, Tracy, do you have any to add? The go-to for me is always ask, is just, you know, ask, ask again, ask every way possible. Mm -hmm. Um, breaking bread with people is usually the way to get them to share the most truth. So that, that would be my go-to move. Right. You know, I, I don't always, I don't always make it known that I'm trying to get this information and then I get more of it. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so how um, do you make it that's what I would known. say. How do you make it not known that you're trying to get no, the information? I mean, I don't always open with, hey, I really want to know what you want for your, you know, for your commission structures and retention. Like, I might not say that I'm trying to get this out of you. Does that make sense? No, because what is it that you do say? I would just ask a lot of questions. Um, be curious, get, build a relationship that, um, builds the foundation of trust. Because I think sometimes when you come at it from just, oh, well, what would you like a bonus plan to be? People don't know what to say. They feel put mm -hmm. on the spot. So mm -hmm. I would really um, go deeper and, and build a relationship to really start to know what your people want. Right. And, and that, that is key, Tracy. I'm so glad you said that because the relationships are what's going to give you the most information anyway. Right. By any chance, do either of you ladies have like a template of a survey of survey questions, good survey questions to ask your employees? I I have tons and tons of those type of templates and yeah, inside mm -hmm. of my business programs. Tons can you share them. something with us? Um, I can I can go through it. It's usually in my paid content, but I can I can probably create something. Yeah, like even a one pager of, hey, these are great yeah. questions to ask your employees. Yeah. That I is can, can very awesome, like Chris. That. I can bring that for next time. I won't be able to grab it tonight, but yeah. Yeah. Next oh. time, when is next time? Next week, we're having another session. The 19th, Monday? Mm -hmm. On, okay. on next so Tuesday, I think Tuesday next, next week, the 20th. Yeah, it's Tuesday next week on the 20th. Oh, I don't think I'm, I got the information about that one. Yeah, Albert, I'm writing myself a note right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps, you know, um, if you are not available, we're going to give you our contact information also kind of at the end. Um, and um, we may be able to just to kind of email you out something because I it sounds like what you're asking is just some examples of how to pose those types of questions. Right, Chris? Not so much examples of how to pose the questions, but what are actual good questions to ask? For example, gotcha. um, what what benefits are important to you? You know, is it PTO? Is it money? Is it a bonus plan? You can have that conversation. But what else should we be asking our employees to create a better work environment for them? Well, I, I think you kind of said it yourself, right? To yeah. create a better work <laughs> environment. Well, and that's that can be different than benefits too, right? So creating mm -hmm. a better work environment 
and what folks want to see as a benefit, those are two different conversations, right? And I want to just add that we have lots of templates and, and I'm, I'll put something together that's simple, but here's mm -hmm. the thing that um, it's an ongoing conversation. So mm -hmm. if you hire, if, if, if you were hiring me today and there was that um, step-by-step sheet that I filled out about all the stuff that's important to me for my pay schedule, my bonus, and, and how, what would, what would retain me as an employee for the long term? Mm -hmm. If you then never asked me or got to know me and then asked me again in a year, it would be very different, right? Mm -hmm. it, you ask me again in three years, five. but if you stay actively curious and always wanting to know that information, you're going to find the sweet spot of what your sort of hiring pool wants the most of. Mm -hmm. And I always come at it from the place of like, it's, we're not going to be able to um, get this perfect for everyone mm -hmm. because we're never going to be like everything to everyone. Right. right. So it, it has to come from the constant conversation of going deep and, as people's life changes, you know, like life happens, people have babies, they move, mm -hmm. they're, they're engaged, or they, they take up some exotic travel that they want to go underwater diving, that that might be an isolated person, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you don't want to make all your bonus structure around just what this one person wants. Mm -hmm. So it's just the idea of, can you create something that fits for everyone, but then maybe there's um, little intricacies as people grow in your company that become your key, key team members, then you really customize it to them because you want to keep them, you know, longer. So and what the, would you recommend oh, to a small business where like, for example, you know, I wear many hats, I wear HR, I wear accounting. I, I don't have the bandwidth to do what you're suggesting. So what do you suggest for a small business that's stretched a little thin? Um, that, I mean, that's the basis of all of it for, you know, for all of us in small business. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that the first is to just start asking the questions and mm -hmm. find out what, like, how many employees do you have right now? 10. 10. So out of the 10, have they, like, ha have you asked them this question before? It's been some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just start talking about it again because mm -hmm. you're, you really, is your goal to retain them because you know how hard it is to hire? Is that what the goal is? The goal is to, yes, happy, have happy employees who want to come to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let me, let me just say, Chris, you know, to that end, that happy employees that want to come to work are not always like benefit it, things are not always the answer. Mm -hmm. Happy employees that want to come to work start with the environment and the culture of your organization, right? The bonuses and benefits are sometimes um, the icing on the cake, but there are people that will walk away from bonuses and benefits if the environment is toxic or if the environment does not make them feel welcomed or valued or anything else. So without knowing specifically you, your business, your employees, you know, you're asking some terrific questions, but our answers will not necessarily be aimed directly at your organization right now because we don't know your organization. So these are just some frameworks and some suggestions of ways that you can start having the conversation. And maybe for you, Chris, since you have a smaller team, um, you know, because 10 folks, they're, they're, there has to be a way that you are able to communicate with, with them at some point. And maybe it's just having a team event, right? Or you're going to buy lunch for the team, or you're having a staff meeting and you need everybody to come in, or maybe you are, are closed a day and you have a team retreat, right? Um, and have your 10 folks there and you provide kind of lunch or a team building activity or something that's fun. But then, you know, part of it can be, at, it can be about getting 
to the core of some of these things. You know what I mean? If you had your dream job or if this was the dream place, what are some things where you, you know, you could see some changes or what are some things you'd like to change? But also understand that you can just ask that question. What, you know, what are some things you like to change? But you also, when you ask that question, understand that there's a vulnerability in you that comes with that because now you're opening yourself up for some truths and you have to be ready to receive those truths and also be in a position where you're ready to make change. You know, you have to know how much change you can make. You know, what is your bandwidth for change? How, you know what I mean? Is, are there any financial restrictions on what you can and cannot do? And also the truth of what may come out of some of those conversations. And sometimes it's not, you know, we take feedback personally and sometimes it's just like you asked, so I'm saying this is what would make me happier. And so it's not necessarily a personal attack, but it's saying these are some things that would make me feel better at work or make me happier or make this an enjoyable place. And you also set the expectation that we may not be able to do all these things. Let's let's like narrow down one or two that we could really address like right now and you look for the low hanging fruit. Right. Because if you ask these questions and then folks see no change, you're not going to get that feedback again, because people are going to be like, why do you keep asking me if nothing's going to change? You know, when you use some of these techniques and you do surveys and you do some of the question asking and see some of the feedback stuff if people don't see a change, then they are not going to engage. They're not going to keep telling you the same thing over and over and over again, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah. You, yeah. If I could just add that sometimes I, I'm just taking, I, you reminded me of a, a personal situation. So I'm going to share this with you, Chris. When I was first growing my salon business years and years ago, and we had about somewhere between 10 and 15 people at the time. I got to the point that I was not delegating enough and I didn't know that they wanted me to delegate more stuff. So that actually became a conversation where they, that when I was asking like, you know, what type of benefits people wanted, what would, um, you know, make them want to refer our place of employment to other people like what would invite them what what would get them to invite their friends to come work here and stay and so much of it was about them wanting to actually help take stuff off of my plate so i just want to put that out there for you you might have some gems within your team that want to help you so it doesn't feel like you're stretched so thin so it, it could just be really having this conversation and when you do um make sure you report back the changes you have made because people will for not realize that, um, oh yeah, the last time you asked me that you implemented everything. So it's like, we have to, as leaders be like repeating ourselves all the time. I, I will often say that I'm so sick of <laughs> hearing myself say this. And by the time I'm sick of it, someone just finally heard it for the first time. So don't forget as a leader, there's going to be a lot of you repeating, oh, last time you suggested this, now we've implemented this. This right. is next. This is next. So um, yeah. does that help? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And just one more thing to that, because I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to just say one more thing is once you do implement those things and once you do share that, before you try to implement something else, get feedback on how those things are working, right? Because with those one or two things that you've implemented, there may need to be some tweaks that happen to that. And those are two, two or three things that you could be working on from three to five years, right? Before you ever have to get to the next thing. Right. So don't just slap it on and say, OK, now now this is it. No, now we've we've tried it this way. We've implemented it. You all said that this is what you wanted. How would how does it feel? How is it working? Um, are there some things that we need to tweak there? Are there some things that would make this even better so that you're focused on just those few initiatives until you get it right? Does that make sense, Chris? Yes. OK, very good. 
Any other questions or comment? Great discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Tracy, for those nuggets and gems. Anybody else? All right, then let's move along. All right, so you want to always be open to change. You want to recognize that your workforce grows, that the needs for your employees will change and you want to be able to embrace those changes. And I think, Tracy, you alluded to that earlier. Like you said, if you ask me in the survey today and then three years not from now and 10 years from now, certainly there will be changes. And so we can't just do this once. We have to constantly be at asking and adjusting as much as we can. Understanding though that the needs of the business are going to come first. So we're not suggesting that you sacrifice the needs of the business, but we're saying, how do you create a win-win, right? And you want to create a constant line of, uh, a consistent line of um, communication so that you are always aware of where your employees are so that you can meet their needs, right? So this is, you know, again, a continuous conversation. And I won't belabor that because Tracy, you talked a lot about that just a bit ago. Um, but if anybody has any additional comments or questions about that. I was just responding in the chat to, okay. um, I'm, I think I'm going to say your name wrong. So please um, correct me, <laughs> but is it Kushali? Kaswali, it's very oh, the same. Name. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for correcting me. That Kusweli. is beautiful. Is mm -hmm. that correct, Kaswali? Okay. Yes. So you had said that the company you worked with showed great appreciation and that you really stayed for eight years because of that. So yes. how did that company do that for you? Because that's what that will help us. Right. So that, how, they, how were they able to just, do that? I don't know. They just made the right, they were very select and selected employees and um, also patients because they wanted to maintain a certain culture yes. within the facility. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Okay. So I and love it just see that out selective. Really well. So they were selective with who they chose, patient that the right people would come. And then were they patient with how they trained you? Yes, there was mm. constant training, continuous mm -hmm. all the time. We had meetings or staffings to keep everybody in loop uh, where all the departments had to join. To, mm -hmm. So everybody knew what was going on, no matter where they were in the building. Right. So and you're it, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. And it's just that that was the first work environment that I had actually experienced like that. And it made me work more because I was so comfortable. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And You're I welcome. think you have really driven home the things that we're trying to say, right? Because what did yes. I say? It starts with the culture, right? Yes, it it really starts does. with the culture. You can have the same industry and you can go from this place to that place to that place doing the same thing, but you stay because of how they make you feel, right? Fantastic. And so, and Chris, again, to, to our point, that's the difference too between the benefits and the culture, right? Just that feeling of appreciation and how they communicated and what they did um, made a lot of difference. And it wasn't stuff that they necessarily had to come out of pocket for, right? It wasn't stuff that necessarily um, cost anything or cost right. a lot, right? Right. And but even it some was, of those that just added to it when they were exactly. provided, saying you don't have to buy lunch today. We provided lunch for you. Just all of that just added to it. Beautiful. Like I said, it's the icing on the cake, right? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So you're welcome. Yep. Learning partners. We are here today. All right. And so we are actually coming up to this is kind of the end, right, of our presentation for tonight. But before we go, one thing that I always like to do is I'm, I have two things that I'm going to ask of you. And um, this is for everyone. First of all, I want you to put in the chat, what is your biggest takeaway from tonight's conversation? The second thing that I want you to think about and put in the chat is 
the one thing this week that you're going to do with the new information that you have that will impact you when you're thinking about generations in the workplace, whether you're doing it as an employee or an employer. So your one great takeaway and one action that you will commit to um, for this week to get done. I can go first. All right, Tracy. So I um, took away that people really need more step-by-step questions, things that will spark the conversation Mm -hmm. for bonus plans, how to increase retention. And I commit to bringing a one sheet for you guys next week. So there you go. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you for kicking us off. All right. Do we have any any wisdom in the chat yet? And if you would rather just speak it, you can certainly do that as well. But oftentimes we find when we write it down, we then have a vision, a visual of that, and that we will um, remain more committed. But if you feel more comfortable just unmuting, please feel free to do that as well. And I don't see my chat moving. So I want you all to get your fingers typing. One takeaway from tonight and one action item. Hello, I see no fingers moving. It must have just been so amazing and wonderful (laughs) that they just could not type. It was just like hands could not type all of that amazing content that you shared, Karen. Okay, well, let's unmute and and let's talk about, let's talk about what those things are. Okay, very good. All right. Can you see Chris's comment or do you want me to read it to you? Yeah. Can you read it to me, please? So it says, we are really struggling with getting our team to finish SOPs. Um, So my immediate takeaway is to check out Loom to get our SOPs done. So everyone can be freed up more productive. Yeah, that is, that is wonderful. Nice. Because when everybody knows what the standard operating procedure is for every area, it frees up so much time and energy spent on asking how to do things. So that, that is a huge first step. Congrats, Chris. Yes. Fantastic. And it also helps to, when you have that, it helps to cater to all learning styles. So whoever you're sharing those SOPs with, um, as well, that could be a value. And you'll see when you record your first video, you can add, um, where you can edit the transcript. So if you have people that would rather read it, they can read the transcript. Mm -hmm. Some people like to follow along with the video with the transcript. And some people like to play the video, put it on pause and, you know, go two steps and then stop. So you'll find that it's going to really help you with um, all your learning styles. Very, very good. All right. What, anything else in the chat, Trace? Um, Just that light bulbs went off. Yay. We love it. And then um, um, uh, Kushley said that Loom is also a great takeaway. Yeah. Good. Um, It was something that Karen said that made me go, oh, this, hey, maybe we need to share this. So there you go. Very good. good. Very good. (laughs) Okay. So finally, we want you to connect with us. So this is me and these are all the ways that you can connect with me. You can certainly shoot me an email. Um, You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And then also here is Tracy's information and you can find her everywhere. She's definitely in in, in more spaces that I'm in, but um you know, and just to stay connected with us, to be able to um, ask questions. And if you have a light bulb moment after the fact, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. 
I do want to share though. Um, one of we, I have this, um, it's a free Facebook group mm -hmm. that is all about supporting, um, female entrepreneurs. So if anybody wants to be a part of it, it's called beyond common business secrets mm -hmm. that you will find a lot of women in there that are really willing to help with all stages of business. So if you, when these kind of things pop up, you know, when we're not doing a webinar every week, that that's a really good place to come and hang out. Karen, I think, are you in that group? I can't remember. I am. In I am. Okay. I, I am like, in that yeah. group. And like, yeah. it's like every Monday we'll do like some type of thought. Like, I think today was like, what, what was the biggest mistake that actually turned into the greatest lesson? So we're always doing thought provoking things that allow people to share some of their stories. And it just helps us flush, flush business out and not do it alone. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, next week we will be talking about Tracy, about bringing solutions to the table, right? How to empower your employees to do that. Uh, yes, we are going to be talking all about solutions. Mm -hmm. And um, that next week, it will be Tuesday, same time, same bat station. L watch out for the emails from SCORE so that you can register for those. And um, that there's that um, series is a part one and a part two. And those are actually the final two um, sessions that we have in this leadership series. And um, I will be the co-pilot next week and the week after for Tracy, as she will take the lead on that content. Um, but really, really great stuff and great um, jewels dropped throughout so we want to make sure that we invite you to um, look for those, register, and come and join us. And then just a few um, other words about SCORE really quickly. Um, SCORE is here for you. Um, they have remote mentoring, um, resilience training. They have a whole resource portal where, where you can access um, various trainings and information and videos. Um, and so wanted to make sure that you check out Score Cleveland for more information. And Score Cleveland, actually, we are serving Northeast Ohio with more than 85 volunteers. Here are some of the areas in which we serve. Um, and so just a little bit more about uh, your Cleveland score, um, but this is a national organization um, and it is a part of um, and uh, the Small Business Administration. Uh, and so again, it has been in existence since the 60s. And so not, you know, they are not new to this. Um, and so, and did I say that it's all free, right? The mentorship, the resources, everything free, free, free. So if you have questions, you want to take some deeper dives into the information, certainly reach out um, and, uh, and get a mentor. Um, and again, because the work is supported by the U.S. Small Business Administration and a few generous sponsors, again, this is saying all of this delivered at no charge to you. Okay. Any final questions before we wrap for tonight? Any final questions, comments? Okay. I don't see anything coming in. Nope. All right. Fantastic. Yes. Well, you. here is the SCORE um, Cleveland website. And here are just a few examples of things that you can find. Free local mentoring, live webinars, um, and all of these things. You can go there. You can apply for a mentor there. Um, so just wanted to share that. And it... That is it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Stop sharing. And uh, Tracy and I will just hang out here for just a few more moments. Um, if you have questions or comments uh, for us, otherwise we will give you this time back in your life um, and hope to see you all next week. And thanks for jo joining, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. And Michael, thank you for the comedy and the creativity and also your participation. Much appreciated.
All right, Harry, did you have a question or comment for us? If you are speaking, you're muted. So you may want to unmute first. Or you can certainly um, drop whatever you need to say in the chat. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Harry may have stepped away. Tracy, as always, thank you so much. Uh, it's pleasure. always my pleasure hanging out with you and being able to kind of tag team this. And until next week. See you next week. It was a pleasure. Thanks, All right. Uh, bye. Bye. bye.